House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. Welcome back into the House of Mystery, and of course I'm Al Warren, and sitting across from me is Dave North Martino. Hey Al, how are you doing? <laughs> you know how I'm doing, come on. Yeah. <laughs> I'm doing terrible. Smoke Smoke and fires. Yeah, you know, I just, I don't, I I don't need to worry about getting lung cancer. I just hang out. Just breathe. Yeah, just breathe. My God. (laughs) Hot and smoky. And then it's warm outside, too. No, just, (laughs) oh, that was a bad joke. (laughs) Anyway. Yeah, I know. Nobody's buying it. Um, Let's see. It's been a, it's another interesting week. And today we've got another um, great writer on. And uh, we're going to be talking to her all the way from Scotland. That's the second Scottish in a week. It is. Yeah. <laughs> Who else um, is uh, Harris, Robert Harris. Yep. He does. Oh, he, wow. does uh, he might even be from the same publisher, and you don't know him? <laughs> no, actually. It's amazing because Scotland is so small, and all the writers know wow. each other. And I've never met Robert, well, I don't think. It's about time. He, um, uh, yeah, yes. this is Denise Mina. Thank you for being here. Just we didn't get that in, but you know, yeah, Robert had his haggis and uh, wife, and uh, was ready to eat and tell us a story, and that was last week. Oh wow! Yeah. Have no clue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It took a while. We didn't understand them, but it was <laughs> 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 it really got going in some of these stories. But no, wonderful man, <laughs> and uh, he's he's kind of doing. I think that was uh, Crimson was his book, and it's about. Uh, Kind of a Sherlock Holmesy sort of. Yes, um, that's right. right. That style of writing wow, and stuff. That's amazing. That's so yeah, fabulous. Yeah, that was a very interesting man. Very nice man. And uh, and um, yeah, so there we go. I don't know. You guys, Scots, are taking over. That's right. We yeah, are. It, wow. So where did it? So you are a multi award winning master of crime. Wow. How did you get that name? So where did, where did you um, start in writing? Like, how did you get so good? Well, <laughs> I'll tell you. Um, actually, I was, I was an academic, and I was doing a PhD in law, and I realized no one's ever going to read this uh, willingly, <laughs> and uh, unless I make it part of an exam. And so, and I thought, you know, really what, I think if you want to disseminate interesting ideas about law, which is really what I wanted to do, I was just that nerdy. I thought, if you put this in a crime novel, people would read it to find out who the murderer was, and they would come across these really interesting ideas. And also, I wouldn't have to use footnotes, which uh, was heavy going. So I wrote a crime novel while I was supposed to be doing a PhD, and at that time, I was in a law school, I was teaching in a law school, um, that was very interested in socio-legal um, issues. And we were all obsessed with detective novels and movies. So I wrote a detective novel and it got published. And um, I said to my academic supervisor, I'm giving up my PhD and I'm going off to be a crime writer. And he said, wow, that's amazing. <laughs> that's how good an academic I was. He was delighted. <laughs> <laughs> go with it, girl, go. Yeah. yeah. So that was about 15 novels um, ago, and uh, I wrote the Garnet Hill trilogy, and, and really I just saw a chance and took it and, and just kept going, and, you know, um, I've just had tremendous luck, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. So when you, when you write one of these stories, like uh, like the new one that you've got, it's uh, Rizzio, um, um, where does that come from for you? Do you just, like, dream up these? Like, where do your ideas come from for the stories? Actually, it was really interesting because the, um, this was a commission from uh, a publisher who wanted contemporary writers to write about incidents in Scottish history. But I'd actually already written a book like this. I wrote a true crime book. Um, I write comics and plays, and I, you know, I really I'll write anything that, that I find interesting. Um, so I'd written a true crime story about a, a serial killer called Peter Manuel, and this is very much in the same vein. He said, "Make it a bit like that one." Um, so it concerns a weekend um, during which Mary, Queen of Scots' secretary, was dragged out of um, a dinner party and murdered by 30 nobles. 
who all had a contract saying, let's kill the Queen and then we'll divvy Scotland up in certain ways and everyone will get their estates back and we'll reverse all these laws and make Protestantism the official religion. But the whole weekend turned on one small woman who was so old, no one thought she was capable of anything. She's 50. <laughs> And uh, her name was Lady Huntley, but that was ancient then. I mean, she's just like, they were like, why aren't you dead? You're a woman and you're 50. Um, and what she did was she smuggled out letters from one group, Mary, to this group outside the palace. And she got Mary to pretend to be having a miscarriage because she was pregnant with um, the man who would become James VI of Scotland, first of England, and bring the two countries together. And she got her to pretend to have a miscarriage. So she was basically screaming and pretending to miscarry all weekend because of Lady Huntley. Um, so that, so it all kind of, the, the whole thing hung on that story. But what I was really interested in was taking a, an oblique look at, you know, it's such a, there are so many um, historical events within that one weekend. But just to focus in really closely on their relationship and how that changed history. Because you always hear about the great men of history, but you never hear about the Lady Huntleys who were carrying um, notes and uh, she was carrying chamber pots about as well, so nobody stopped to frisk yeah, her. Right. You know, nobody stops me when I'm carrying my chamber pots around. <laughs> <laughs> I think go the other direction. <laughs> well, you know, but uh, so when you go back, like, uh, of course, you've got a lot of history with your PhD, but um, it, it must be very, um, I don't want to say time consuming, but it must take a lot of work. Um, and research to get the details so accurate because it's harder to find the information the further you go back. Well, this is so well documented. That was one. I mean, I thought I would be making it all up. But actually, Mary Queen of Scots gave two sworn statements about everything that happened. And then one of the men who had organized the plot gave a sworn, an 11 page sworn statement that is full of lies. He's just lying the whole time. And he keeps, uh, everyone's attacking everyone, and then he stops them to give a sort of legal defense statement. I mean, it's just, it's like it's like the cops in the 70s used to commit what we call perjure, um, verbal perjuries, where they would go in and arrest a guy, and the guy would say, I did have those drugs, and this is a fair arrest. And they would stand up in court and say this kind of thing. Um, and uh, so, but, but between the, those two statements, it's very well documented what happened, because everyone was there. So, uh, you know, there was like um, every important person in Scotland had signed a contract and gave a version of what happened that night. So it's really well documented. And you can go into the rooms that it happened in. Wow. Do you dress up in the outfits too? And... <laughs> I'm, not, you know, I'm not much of a one for that. I actually did a TV show recently retracing um, uh, Boswell and Johnson's tour of Scotland. And one of the things was they said, uh, you know, we're going to have surprises. The production team said, we're going to have occasional surprises. But can you tell us what wig size you take? <laughs> what? Said, Look, I'm not confident enough to dress up in period costume on television, so I'm not doing that. <laughs> yeah, it's like, sorry, I've got another appointment. Yeah. I, I, you know, I mean, I'm just, that's yeah. not for me. So, um, uh, so when we filmed it, the other person who was presenting with me, Frank Skinner, he dressed up in period costume, and I just stood next to him and looked like a big yeah. happy guy. <laughs> so he he had the he had the woman's wig on, and <laughs> no, he had um, he had Richard. I mean, he looked boss, I have to say, and he had a periwig on, and he was loving it. I mean, it was his t it's, it's how he should always dress. He looked amazing, but I didn't think I would look particularly good in it. But, but basically, you can go back to where everything happened. And there's a stain on the floor that's supposed to be the stain of the, from the murder because they dragged this guy into a presenting room and all the nobles took turns stabbing him. It's just like Caesar. Wow. It's very important that everyone was implicated. And uh, there's a bloody mark on the floor that's supposed to be the mark of his blood. But it's not. I mean, obviously, it's not. But, um, uh, so you get a real sense of... You know the, the space that this thing happened in, and how close things were, and um, you know how what it would feel like for thirty men to come into the come through the door um, of this very small, quite intimate room. Yeah, I guess you really can capture the the mood or the feeling when you go to a, a location like that too, right? Very much so. And uh, you know, when I'm writing fiction, I usually try and work out where all the characters live. 
because that gives you a real sense of, all right, you're this far from a pub. They have to walk there to, you know, they park near their house. Do you know, it just gives you a real sense of it. And going back to Hollywood Par Palace to reimagine that and the small staircase they all came piling up and how drafty it is and how cold it is and give you a real sense of what it must have felt like and uh, how close they all were to each other. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty amazing. I, I, I think a lot of people don't don't realize the context of some of these stories, you know, when they, they grow up now yeah. and they read something, they don't necessarily um, feel it the same way. Uh, I think especially since Game of Thrones, because we imagine everything on a huge yeah. scale. And actually, you know, lots of things just happened in rooms that really, you, you know, if you saw a flat and it was uh, Mary Queen of Scots Apartments, you would say, yeah, no, I think I'll just take something else. It's really big enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know mean, it's 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 crazy. I guess we're we get quite spoiled as time goes on, you know. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Did, did did you find out anything that you were surprised about when you were doing the research or putting this together? Lady Huntley's husband was stuffed. His body was stuffed, and he was put on trial for treason by Mary Queen of Scots before any of this happened. Now, I've never yeah. ever, ever heard of that. Or what had happened was he had led a rebellion against Mary, Queen of Scots. He um, died on the battlefield of a massive heart attack, but they needed to try him as a message to everybody else. So they taxidermied his body with straw, and then they stood him up in Parliament, and they put him on trial. And Lady Huntley still helped Mary, Queen of Scots. So either she was an extraordinary woman or her husband was a very bad man. Well, that's crazy. Um... What, you know, wow. it, it, did he testify? <laughs> <laughs> How can you do that? I mean, that's ridiculous, right, when you think about this. Well, you know, you think about olden days and you think, yes, it was quite brutal then and people did get killed. But what you don't really think about is just how damaged everybody was. People were so, so damaged, you know. And one of the things that I had to cut out of the book because I just went on for far too long about it was the social meaning of public executions at that time, when there was a consensus about everyone was Catholic, you know, a public execution was an opportunity for someone to die a good death because they could repent just before they died. And one of the problems with Catholicism was you didn't know when you were going to die. That's why people were never out to chapel. Um, but once that consensus broke down and, people, and, and there were Protestant martyrs, the meaning of public executions all kind of evaporated and they just became gory shows. Um, and uh, I had to cut that out because, as you can hear, I can't stop banging on about it. And they said, this is half yeah, a book. Well. <laughs> well, but I think it's an important point. I do, because, I mean, uh, is it really all that different today? Like if we had, um, if there was a pay-per-view um, you know, yeah. of, of someone being executed, would, would people buy it? They would. <laughs> they really would. And they actually, they had, to, um, they had to, I mean, I would disapprove of it, but I would want to know what happened. Because people, because human beings are, you know, drawn to excesses, and if you give them some justification, um, you know, they'll, they're, they're very interested in that. But, I mean, at one point it had a very distinct spiritual meaning, and that was all lost at that particular point. Um, I, yeah, I think that's really fascinating. Um, and, you know, the idea of, of people um, being able to make a final confession, all of that evaporated and it just became really brutal and spiteful. And actually, one of the reasons that public executions were stopped in Britain was not because uh, they were considered brutal, but it was because the crowd watching behaved so badly. Oh, well. hmm. Yeah, there were riots and there was quite a lot of public fornication. <laughs> oh, that's, you know, that's all right. We do that a lot on this show. <laughs> <laughs> but but, uh, <laughs> but I, I, could, um, I could imagine, um, gee, so that would even be better now. We'd have a more of an excuse to run it. The UK should be running it now because they could do it on TV and yeah, people we should... behave. Yeah, because you have dissipated the yeah. crowds. It's such a malevolent thing, isn't it? It's so interesting that, you know, that, that um, sadism is, you know, such an uncomfortable thing for people to deal with mm. or acknowledge that, that you know, we, we, like, we like bad people to be other people. But, you know, to unpack, I mean, I, I write crime and often I read crime and often I read crime and I think that wasn't 
bloody enough for me. I'm not interested in jewel thieves. Yeah. You know, we don't all watch CSI because we care about justice. Um, it's, there is a wee bit of that in everybody, a little bit of spite, a little bit of othering, uh, you know, a little bit of uh, witnessing brutal events. And, uh, and you know, for some people, it would be a high point. I mean, I, I think a lot of sports, maybe boxing. I like watching boxing. Mm. Maybe boxing is substitute for that. I'm not mm. sure. Yeah. Well, then, you, you know, you're, you're, you're not going to like my books. I'm... I... <laughs> <laughs> you think you like about... Uh, Missing no, tickets. I do true crime, but I, I don't get into the gore too much. And is that because you're uncomfortable or you think it's unnecessary or you think it's unfair to the Well, victims? I think it's more about the victims. You see, on the older books that I write, you know, where everyone's passed and gone, it's 100 years, I, I can be more open about that sort of thing. But on, on some of the later ones I've written were people that are still alive and their family and their, there's still a lot of people around and, and I don't think it's needed. People ever write to you and say you went too far? Yeah. Even though you're yeah. very careful? Oh, yeah. And, and I think it's, it's really important to make sure that the victims are, are, are as comfortable as possible. Absolutely. And, but, but then your line might not be my line. Yeah. You know, and, I mean, I'm, I'm incredibly careful about that. And, and people have said to me, thank you so much for doing this. And other people have said, I can't believe you did that. You'll do anything for a buck. Yeah. And uh, um, it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting ethical conundrum. Should we not talk about this? Should we never talk about military history? or question decisions that were made. Because that's the same issue, isn't it? What I did was, like, on this last one that's done really well, I actually went to the victims that remained in the family and asked them what they felt comfortable with because, what you know, what this guy had done to their two little girls was pretty, you know, horrific. And um, so I, I made sure they were comfortable because not only that, I don't think the reader needs to know all the gory details to understand um, the story, you know? Yeah. Or, or maybe the aspect of the story you're interested in. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm quite interested in, in the results of how everybody moves on and kind of what goes on in their life and try to follow it that way. So, um, yeah, so I guess that's sort of it. But enough about me. Nobody cares about me. Um. <laughs> oh, no, it doesn't tell me. Oh, the censure I use. What's it? Oh, I'm writing it down. <laughs> <laughs> no, your advice. Well, just just give reference to me then on your next. Um, do you ever do, do you ever worry about um, the way things like this go, like uh, with Mary Queen of Scots and and the whole uh, empire and uh, government and and we were talking about this before, like coups and stuff like that. Do you think that's just going to be a, a regular thing that happens with humans, just this sort of scenario, but maybe in different times or different equipment, so to speak? Yeah, I do. I mean, I think um, I think you know, coups are subtler, and power grabs are, are more subtle. And uh, you know, I think I think it's um, you know, people are aware of the fact that, for example, January the sixth did not play well. Um, and um, you know, but the, but you know, the, the 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 whole point about the story is it is an elite fighting amongst themselves, and the only casualties are working people. And um, for me, that was what really came over in the story. The only two people um, who were executed were two nothing burger guys who genuinely believed in this religious cause. And the people who had contracts with the other conspirators saying, I will get my estate in Moray back, um, nothing happened to them because they were too powerful. So, I, you know, I, I think that, that that happens constantly. And it doesn't just take a coup. Um, but it's very important to remember that, that, that you know, these battles are never really about sharing power. They're about taking power. And, um, and it's usually a very small group of people who are taking that power. And they're not interested in what happens to other people. If anyone goes to prison for January the 6th, it will not be Trump or anyone who facilitated Trump. It will be, um, you know, small people um, who are just casualties. Right, right. People that got caught up in it. And went down and did the thing, and then uh, they'll pay. People they'll eat. pay with their time and and whatever. Who I, who I have sympathy with because these are true believers, and they did 
they, you know, they drank the Kool-Aid and they believed all that stuff. Um, it's the cynics who orchestrate that, who they know that these people are not maybe very stable and they're quite prepared to use them and they don't care what happens to them afterwards. I think that's damnable. Do you, do you ever wonder why, but with, with people, why this is an ongoing thing? Like, why do people um, fall into worship? another human so much that they'll do things like that or they'll risk their own life and family to go and get something of a change which you know there's never ever going to be the change that they want they're never going to get that idea that they're sold well i mean i think it's religion i don't mean you know classical religion but i think it's people love to have an absolute belief and they love being excited and carried away and they, they don't really, it's very difficult to, to accept that all of life is chaos. That's a very uncomfortable truth. And people want absolute bad guys and absolute good guys and they, um, you know, they curate the information that gets into their heads so they never have to say, uh, you know, we had an independence referendum right. here and the, the most intelligent person I met said, it's very difficult for me, everyone had a position, um, he said, it's very difficult for me because I can always see both sides. And I thought, you're a genius. That's how you dissipate this, is you try and see both sides. You know, when you take an absolute position and you're angry at anybody, say to yourself, well, what are they thinking? How, how do you think they're thinking? But that, you know, it takes a lot of emotional work and it's much more exciting to believe that you're absolutely going to solve everything and they're stealing children. When you go back in history, everyone's always doing things to children. That's, that's how you get people to go to war. In the First World War, the Germans were attacking children. Um, during the Reformation, Catholics and or Protestants were killing children. It's always about children. Um, so it's always very frothy and emotional. I can see I could really get caught up in something like that um, if I wasn't a bit melancholy um, and maybe was fitter or had a car. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's just a lot of well, yeah, well, I mean, you know, I, I mean, we've been on the eating baby, you know, on pizzas, you know, and Hillary Clinton and all mm -hmm. that, right? I mean, it's the same thing. There's this real, um, you take a, uh, that's what I mean, you have to, you, I think what you say is right, because you take um, someone that has the answer, this person is correct, this is the way we needs to be, and the other ones are evil. Right? Yeah. So anyone who tells you they have the answer is a liar or an idiot. That's a good principle upon which to work, is that, you know, this is going to take, you know, like the climate um, change, it's going to take a lot of effort and everyone's going to have to make a big effort. We're all going to have to think about it a lot. Isn't it easier just to say that's not happening? It's much, much easier. I mean, think about those two options, you know. Um, it's a lie. Um I mean, that's why people are attracted to easy answers and leaders who say they'll fix everything. But it's never happened. I, I've never had, uh, in my lifetime, I've never seen a leader fi fix anything. They don't. I mean, it's all based on this myth that government can do everything. Um, you know, that, that this tiny government are going to sort out the world economy and fix the oil price. Um, they're not. And, if, and then, of course, when they don't, they have to say, well, this other government was stopping us. But, um, uh, you know, I mean, I'm now ages with people who are senior politicians, and I just don't know how they can um, think they're going to fix everything. I can barely get out of the chair to turn the television on. <laughs> well, yeah, I always say that, too. I mean, you know, especially when the, with the conspiracies, you know, like, you know, COVID's not real or it's, you know, it's all planned and, and faked. And I'm thinking the government can't even pave your road. How are they <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, this is uh, the incompetence in in humanity is just uh, is huge, and that's in every field. And so you can't. You no, know, one of the things about secrets is if if three people know a secret, one of them's going to tell everyone. Always, <laughs> always. It's like they haven't so they haven't landed on the moon, and they've kept it secret for like sixty years. And you're like, yeah, if all of all of the employees and all the pilots, and you're thinking, not one person ever talked, you know, I, I know. Mafia guys <laughs> tell everybody. Yeah. <laughs> you have to be careful not to, not to get too um, political, I would say, I, I don't like that word, but not to get too um, 
r- righteous wrong sort of toward any of your characters and, and ideas? And- well, it's interesting because it's very old. It's a very old story. So you can talk about it and you can talk about it honestly. And actually, you can't live in Scotland and not argue with people about politics. You just can't. <laughs> um, so it's, I think it's trying to avoid it, trying not to offend anybody. But I think the most important thing is it's, it's such an interesting story. You don't need to take a position on it. Um, you know, you really don't need to. I mean, at one point, everybody in Edinburgh realised something was happening in the palace, and they all grabbed torches and stormed down to the palace to try and stop it. And, and it's just, it was just like an incredible, incredible weekend. So much stuff happened um, that, you know, you could politicise it or you could not politicise it, but it's essentially an argument that's been rumbling around Scotland since the dawn of time. And... Uh, um, you know, it's a good enough story without me superimposing my political position mm, on it. Yeah, well, that's pretty interesting. So, so with something like this, how do you get into the um, characters? Like, how do you get into these people and try to um, it come across of how they would feel and act and, and what they would do? I mean, you've got sex, secrets, and lies, right? Sort of. So, when you get into that, how do you? How do you try to encompass that? Well, I think, you know, just trying to imagine, probably very much like you, trying to imagine what it looks like to somebody and how it feels to them. And obviously you can't do that because it's so far in the past. This is like the 16th century. So, um, you know, the but just trying to, I mean, one of the central characters for me was a man who had been a priest and then he became a Protestant. And he basically became an assassin. And on the night of the assassination, he wandered down to Edinburgh and killed a priest. And maybe killed two priests, actually. And I found him fascinating because he is, you see him all the time now. It's not hard to imagine. He is one of the people who stormed the castle on January the 6th. He is the guy that everyone has wound up and and can't be stopped because he is a true believer. So he was very easy to get into. Mary, Queen of Scots, I found quite difficult because... Um, she's very young. I mean, she's only like 23 or 24 in this. And, um, uh, and, and, but I try to imagine it as the moment when she realises that she's not going to be able to fix it because just before this happened, she was just about to make herself safe and she was just about to go into her confinement to have her baby. Um, so, that, you know, I mean, I think most people can, most women can certainly imagine what that's like. And then she suddenly realises that nothing's going to be okay and it's all chaotic and she's married to a vicious idiot and her in-laws are trying to kill her. That was basically my sort of end point with her. I wonder when you write your characters, um, do you have an inner monologue? Uh, can you hear your char- characters in your head? Um, I know I, I hear voices. <laughs> but I'm, I'm wondering if, if you have an inner monologue or if it's more images and symbols that you're, you're kind of transcribing when you write. It's very much images with me, so I can see the scene. That's why the place is the location so important, because if I can see it, then I can smell it, and then I can feel it, and I can feel directional heat. And um, I don't know if you've read Snow by Bogakov. He describes writing a play, and he fever, and he describes writing it, and he says that he saw a box, and then he just wrote down what happened in the box. And that's that feels very much like my process. But do you hear... Do you hear written language or do you hear spoken language? Um, I, I guess I hear both. You know, I can hear, wow. I actually hear the prose in my head and I kind of transcribe <sighs> it and I hear the characters' voices. So I'm insane. Wow. <laughs> yeah, he's a complete nutball. <laughs> he's not anybody you want to meet on the street. No, so. no, no. <laughs> None of us are terribly well, to be honest, writers. <laughs> <laughs> and he's not even doing drugs. So. I know. I get a start. <laughs> Do you ever see? You ever see the language in your head, written down? I had a friend who saw wow. text. No, I, I typically I do see, you know, uh, things like a movie, the images and stuff. So I transcribe from that way too. But yeah, I, I, I just hear and then I see visual images. I see things and I hear oh, things. <laughs> Mm-hmm. But, yeah, that's fascinating, though, about uh, actually yeah. seeing the text. Yeah, yeah, he saw it written, and he could even describe the font that it wow. was in. Wow. Mm. That's very, that's very mm. interesting. Wow. Yeah. 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 See, more, Denise, de- 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 she dresses up like Mary Queen of Scots, and 
I do too. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> the, the difference is she's writing about Mary and you're not. Oh, okay. <laughs> that's an issue, okay? okay. <laughs> hey. uh, now, how do you feel like when you complete a book like this and you look back at it, um, do you think it's made a change in yourself somehow? I'll be honest with you. I wrote this book in a, a panic. I, I, I'll be honest with you. I write every book in a panic because I never believe it was the And I always go and see this one friend and say, I don't think I can do this. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just, it's just like rubbish. It's just like bits of rubbish. And she says, you say this every time. She swears a lot. This every time. So when I finished that book, um, I just thought, oh, God, I hope that's all right. And uh, and then I got it back, and they were very, very excited about it, and I got it back. And, and I reread it, and it wasn't what I thought it was. It was much more exciting than I thought it was. It is quite, and it's very short, but it's quite exciting. And um, uh, and then I, and then people started reacting to it. And it's it's a really strange bit of story because it's, a, it's such an in, ignoble story about, you know, Scotland loves its history. The history is always about, you know, the underdog winning out, do you know what I mean? And this is this sort of story is the sort of story Scottish people do not like to tell about ourselves, where everyone with power attacked a pregnant woman in the hope that she would die of a miscarriage. It's really um, dishonourable. I mean, nobody comes out of it well. And uh, so it, it, it's a story that people kind of know, but they really don't know anything about. And it felt like a very important story to tell, but I only saw that when I was reading it again. When I finished it, like everything, I just thought, God, that was a misbegotten bit of nonsense. Yeah. I could have done that if I'd had 10 years. Right. <laughs> yeah, I, I have the same impression when I write as well. I get the same, um, this is a pile of garbage and I'm stressed <laughs> and panicked. And then and then, mm. um, then you get it back and then, yeah, and I'm going through it. And I go, well, it's not, no, I guess it wasn't as bad as I, I don't know what that is. Um, some sort of. I think it's like when you're in a room and the only bit that you could the only bit that your eye is drawn to is where you went over the skirting and that's all you can see in the room. And then sometimes if you go away for a long time and come back to it, you say, That actually doesn't really matter that much. But you need to get to the point where you're hypercritical. I think most writers have a committee of critics on their shoulder who say this is all garbage and that's how you make it better. Mm. But it's not very enjoyable. Yeah, no. It's not when people say they write for enjoyment, I want to slap them. <laughs> <laughs> I knew a writer who didn't criticize his own work, and it was awful. It was the worst thing I've ever read. And he just said, this is it, it's finished, it's brilliant. And it was just, it was just mince. <laughs> and it was just the most flat nonsense. He had a great weekend. It was a writing weekend, he had a lovely time. But um, uh, but I realised that that critical that discomfort with your own work is very important. I think to make it better. I wonder also um, after writing uh, a, a piece of fiction, do you have a way to decompress, or do you even need to decompress? Can you just move on to the next thing? No, I just move on to the next thing. To be honest with you, I'm usually panicky about the next thing. <laughs> I mean, it, 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 when you're at book festivals, it looks as if you're very casual and cool. But I'm just glad I'm sitting down and I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she takes. I understand that. Quite greedy, and I don't do much. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you, you think? Uh, but then I look back at it and I think, God, you know, I've had some great adventures, and I've had, to, you know, people have let me do amazing things. I wrote Hellblazer for DC mm. Comics for a year. I can't quite believe they let me do that, you know, and 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 that was fitted in between books. So I don't tend to decompress. I tend to just. Uh, move on to the next thing, and um, and it, it feels like decompression because it's a different. It's very often a very different form. Like I'm writing a play or something like that. Do you take time out? Um, I do. Um, I, you know, I tend I tend to you know do martial arts. That's that's kind of my uh, <laughs> my my escape. Uh, going to something physical after doing something that's uh, more mental. And I guess I am very mental. <laughs> <laughs> And, and so would you go off on a, uh, like a weekend to do that, or would you just take, make that the centre of your day? Um, I do both. Sometimes I'll do a seminar, sometimes, um, uh, especially like uh, after I'm done writing, I'll, I'll uh, pick something and just go and train. 
you know, for, for 30 minutes to an hour or something like that, just to you know, refresh, refresh my mind. Get back in your <laughs> and then he wipe, wipes out yeah. the buffet afterwards. Yes, after that, yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> You know, you were talking about um, <laughs> talking about Hellblazer and the uh, uh, doing uh, graphic novels, and you adapted the um, Girl with the Dragon Tattoo um, into a graphic novel. I, um, I'm just wondering, um, what's your process for adapting a novel or movie to a graphic novel, and how is it working with um, another writer's characters? Hey, do you know, it's really fascinating. Uh, it's so interesting because it's such a constrained form. So, so what I usually do is I read through the book and uh, and then go by cha- chapter by chapter to look at the events because it's because comic scripts are so constrained and they work in a really different way to prose. And actually, it's really changed the way I write prose because you have to have um, teasers to take you onto the next page. Mm. Um, you know, you don't want to close down a beat at the bottom of a page. You want to close down the beat halfway down the page. You have to think about how the artist is going to do the illustrations, um, you know, how, what you can use for a splash, which is like a full page big reveal, um, you know, how the, how, how you're going to cut down all the dialogue. Mm. And, you know, from to comics, no one can really have an internal dialogue. Um, it, normally in crime fiction, right? You get all the clues and then the detective goes off and has a think yep. and they get drunk or something <laughs> like a bar fight realize something that they probably couldn't work out from those clues, but it works. Now, in graphic novels, you can't do that. You have to see everything. Mm. Visual medium. It really makes you... I mean, it's really interesting writing exercise, um, and you can't, have a, you can't really have more than 30 words of dialogue in any single panel, wow. or it takes up space for the art. Yeah, it's like haiku. Wow. And uh, so... My, well, much shorter since I, since I, I wrote comics because it's such an intensely disciplined form. Wow, that's amazing. Sounds like... Yeah. Mm. yeah, Dave likes yeah. discipline. <laughs> <laughs> well. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, okay, so now, um, you, do you have a website or a place that you like people to, you know, and fans to come uh, find out about your writing and more about you? Well, um, denisemina.com, and I'm on Twitter as Dame Denise Mina. I fraudulently claim to have a damehood, and um, and now people think I do have a damehood. <laughs> and um, quite often I'm on the news, and they write me up as Dame Denise Mina, and I haven't the heart to tell them, no, that was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, you know. And then they're in on it, so that whenever I'm on the news, they always put up Dame Denise Mina because they think it's <laughs> That's <funny."> awesome. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. They, they don't call me Dane, but, um, but they call me others. <laughs> <laughs> so how was it? With, did you have any issues with the pandemic and all the the wild, wild, wild west weird stuff the last couple of years? Do, do you find it gets inv- involved in your writing? Well, um, I'm trying to not write about it because uh, uh, when I sit down to write something, I always think, what do I want to read and I don't want to read about the pandemic or people panicking mm. or, or I want to read about people traveling. So I'm now writing a book about someone who finds um, a casket that belonged to Pontius Pilate and it may or may not have proof of Christianity in it. And, um, and people go on a big journey and they have to travel all around the world. A follow up to a book called Conviction. Uh, but that's, it, it, you know, because what I really wanted was to escape, to not think about this, to pretend the world was uh, normal, and um, and to go travelling. And uh, so I thought that's what I'm going to write for people. Well, yeah, but um, does the darkness seep into your writing? Do you feel stressed? Like, you know, not the normal panic of, of being in the edit process or writing, but the actual, um, you know, you're sitting around and you're putting together a story and writing, and there's stressful things going on outside. Um, you may not write about it or include it, but um, d- does it become a little darker, your writing, do you think? Well, you know, it's funny because I think my writing is always very dark, and I go to Scandinavia and people say, oh, your books are very funny. <laughs> and then I just... <laughs> I'm a bit depressed. I'm like, well, it's cultural. So, I mean, and I think, um, I, you know, I mean, I think uh, everything is quite dark. And, uh, and, you know, my base mood, I think if you're, you know, I really think 
Um, the, the kind of blatant darkness is very much the purview of young people. As you get on a bit, dark things happen, and uh, and the giggliest people I know are the people who have lived through the darkest things. Mm. Oh, <laughs> yeah. And uh, I don't think there's any point in, you know, I'm not going to books to find out um, about uh, stuff like that. But obviously it's there. You know, my mum's been in and out of hospital for two years. Uh -huh. um, so I've been right in the heart of the pandemic. And, and she got COVID and uh -huh. got out. And then she was um, uh, desperate to get home to smoke. And uh, she's a wife. <laughs> and uh, she's still here. You know, she's amazing, you know. And um, so that, I mean, it has been really terrifying. And I just feel like I don't think I'm, I'm going to be reading for to be terrified. It's interesting because, you know, really gory books, I think um, they're very much about being in a state of peace. And I don't think people in war zones read uh, books about serial killers chasing people around, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. um, I think books do different things, and I think we go to... We go to the arts for different things, and I think escapism has saved more lives than penicillin, and we should really acknowledge that. Yeah, know? that's why. That's why. <clears throat> excuse me. That's why we laugh and and try to have a laugh because we do mm. cover a lot of you know darker and you know more horrid stuff. So I think people uh, sometimes they don't understand that, but I think it's sort of you know. Well, you know, to be honest, if you don't understand why awful things need humour, then maybe truly terrible things have not happened to you. And if they have and they do, you're going to have to develop a sense of humour or you're not going to get through them. It's, it's such a blessing to have a sense of humour. Uh, and, you know, I don't think that you can separate things out because life is just a big mess. And, you know, if you read something like The Arabian Nights, comedy's in there with gothic gore, with murder mysteries, and that is real life. We always separate these things mm -hmm. out in books. Uh, I don't think we should do, because I think that, that real life is funny and terrible and wonderful and scary and, you know, awe-inspiring, and that's just realistic, yeah. you know? Yeah, and, and for the listeners, you know, if you haven't lived through anything terrible or horrific like that, then Denise will come by, just send her an email, and she'll... She'll give you something horrific to live in. <laughs> <laughs> and then you'll understand, right? <laughs> you are entitled to uh, be miserable if you don't. <laughs> I'll tell you, you know. Well, that's interesting. And, and the latest thing when you're writing about Pontius Pilate and stuff. So d how is that covering r a religious sort of person like that or someone that had a big... Um, you know, big place in, in religion and, and Jesus and stuff. Because there's, I don't know how it is in Europe right now, but in, in, in the States there's really a, a sentiment that uh, religion's under attack and that people are are trying to take away your religion and stuff like that. Do you, do you, do you think that there will be any sort of a backlash when you cover something like that? I'm sure there will be, yeah. Oh. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Like you just sort of go ahead and like whatever. Yeah, you know, my, my purpose is never to offend people, and you can always not buy that book. And it's really not about religion. It's about the arts and artifacts market, and um, which is absolutely fascinating. And, um, you know, I mean, it is how you, you, you drug dealers who got tired stopped um, import. Basically, U.S. Customs realized they were getting Iraqi artifacts in the same packaging they used to find heroin in and it was because drug dealers realized oh wait i get 50 years for importing heroin but if i steal you know the epic of gilgamesh i get two years if i import it into america illegally so the arts and antiquities market is worth a fortune mm. an absolute fortune and no one really talks about it in crime fiction because it's a bit complicated um, and the market has heated up wildly because hobby lobby um, have opened a museum of the Bible, and they just went around the world throwing money around. They've recently have, had to give back a cuneiform tablet of the Epic of Gilgamesh and because they bought it and it was illegal. It was an illegal import. They really weren't sure what they were buying, but they were just very, very adamant, and they were throwing money around. Um, I, I mean, it's just a fascinating world, and it's full of really mad characters and um, unlicensed priests and this kind of thing. So... 
I don't think I don't think people are going to be offended because it really isn't about religion. It's about the object <laughs> that involved in religion and the market around that, which I think is you know kind of fascinating. Yeah, it's an interesting area. You just you can see people's behaviour around such things. That's pretty pretty far out. Interesting, you know. Oh, it really, you know, and um, and I think a lot of people of faith. Um, would be very interested in having that questioned and brought out into the open, um, because you know, uh, you know, there there are so many different schisms, and you know, my intention is—I mean, I come from a very religious family, and uh, my intention is never to offend anybody. Um, but you know, you can be a cultural Catholic and talk about the culture of a religion without talking about the basic tenets of faith. So, I mean, I would never question any... And people have the right to believe whatever they want to believe. That's never, you know, I would never question that. I mean, um, you know, I believe things that are you know, probably ludicrous to other people. Um, so it's, it's not really about faith. It's about that market and how everyone's afraid to look at it because uh, there's so much money there. And there's a lot of middle class and upper class money there. Oh, I need to get into that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm writing that down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, boy, and, and there's so much going on with the Catholic Church. Hey, you hear about the, the, uh, uh, you know, the all the bodies they've been finding in Canada, right? Yeah. Yes, I have been all the indigenous children who died in state schools. That's just crazy. I'm surprised it hasn't really made the American media. Um, really? Is it not? Because it's big over yeah, here. Yeah, no, America has been avoiding it. Um, you know, but this is this is NBC. No, and we follow through on the other networks, and I, I I still waiting to see any of the real coverage. They seem to be more on the other things. They've got they've got their plates full right now. Mm. Yeah, I think so. But it really resonates with us here because of Ireland, you know, because there were um, um, mother and baby in the hospitals in Ireland, and they found a lot of unmarked graves of small children who died in those uh, mother and. You know, I mean, I have cousins who were born in those places and could have been buried in unmarked graves. They found a cistern full of remains. I wonder what they were doing with all those children. You know, we hear stories that there's tests being run on them. I, I wonder in Canada if it was different, but over here it was almost certainly neglect. And, you know, to see it from both sides, just to be very boring, a lot of the people who worked in those places were incredibly damaged and really ignorant, and they were not trained to do the jobs they were doing, and they were brutalised and brutalising. You know, hurt people hurt. And, um, I mean, I was taught by nuns, you know, some of whom were, like, 17. And what were those girls doing going into convents at that age? That's no time to decide that you have a vacation. You know, that's that's the whole organisation, the way the institution was organised, it was 300 years out of date, and they were being left in charge of very vulnerable people, um, and uh, and I think that's what happened over here, but I don't know if uh, I don't know what happened. But I suspect it was neglect and disdain. I think that's really, you know, what killed all those people was was nobody was watching, and the people that were working there didn't care enough to take care of people properly. Yeah, I'm just shocked in how many there were in in each of these uh, the numbers schools. Are... Like one now is like over 700. Wow. <gasps> Mother yeah. Were they, were they very isolated? Uh, well, well, yeah, but they, the, the yeah, but that's Canada, right? Yeah. Canada, especially in the prairies, because you have a, a town, even the first one where they found Kamloops, which is north of the desert here, uh, you know, it, it only had, you know, 15,000 people in the city, and um, they were outside of it in their own private area, so they, they, they didn't even, they weren't interacting with any populations. Well, there was a there was a mother and ba- there was an orphanage next door to my mother's village in Glasgow. My mum was one of fifteen, and the children from the orphanage people kind of knew what was going on there. So I wonder, but they didn't think they could speak up because it was the church, and also because it was such a hard scrabble life for them. And uh, and there's been a big investigation into what was happening there, and children were buried there in unmarked graves, so the locals knew about it. And, you know, I think we have to look at it in context, but we also have to look at it and say, did people know what was happening? 
Why did no, how can we stop this ever happening again? As well as looking back and making restitution, yeah, you know? Yeah, it's pretty it's it's pretty amazing when you find these things. Pretty shocking, you know. Um but um sure there's more to come, you know. Well, so now your book comes out on when? This is on pre order right now. So when does it when does it officially become released? The very start of September. Ooh, boy, line ups now. Pre order now for this <laughs> book, you know. It's been very, very interesting talking to you and we we've learned a lot. You know. What a treat talk. Yeah, yeah, you know, and we learned Denise likes to dress up and as Queen uh Queen Mary of Queen, Queen of Scots, <laughs> and um, and if if you don't like to laugh, she'll come hunt you down, <laughs> give you something to laugh about. <laughs> I'll tell you. Put the smile on your face. <laughs> You'll be crying. You're so happy. Oh well. Anyway, well, it's been interesting and a very good book. I we're talking about Rizzio, and it's a novella. And uh, that'll be out on September 1st. And, of course, we'll have that up on our website, and we'll have it where people can just do one click and pick it up. And uh, and don't forget, the website will be connected to ours as well. So we, uh, we really uh, had a good time, and you've done it all. So the great Denise, Maya, thank you for being here. Thank you so much. It was a real pleasure, guys. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Denise. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. The mission has been completed. The end! By George, he's got it! It is the end! I'll see you! If you're lying to me, I'll be back. This has been a production of Something Weird Media.